A couple of years ago, an American missionary was killed by locals while walking ashore on North Sentinel Island, a small outcrop in the Indian Ocean halfway between India and Myanmar. The inhabitants, who were well known for their aggressiveness towards outsiders, cut him down with a barrage of arrows and spears, killing the poor soul less than a minute after he got out of his kayak. They then buried him in the sand and retreated back into the forest that covers the interior of the place. The entire thing was witnessed by local Indian fishermen, whom the missionary had paid to transport him to the island. Reading the newspaper articles about the unfortunate event brought back a lot of memories for me, because 10 years earlier I went ashore on that very same beach. The only difference was that I did so during a cloudy night, and needless to say, I didn't get caught. Altogether, I spent seven days on the island, and I got to see a whole lot more than the beach. Some of it I wish I could unsee, but unfortunately, it will remain with me until the day that I close my eyes for the final time. But before I get into what had happened, let me give you a little bit of background information. My name is Michael Huddersfield, and from 1992 to 2010, I was employed by a shadowy corporation called Fear Inc. It's a group that's been around since the 1950s, and whose sole purpose is to provide exceptional thrills for its members. The way this is achieved is by sending their employees to hotspots all over the globe. The employees are always unarmed and only equipped with a camera and minimal food rations. The members then get to see how the fare and bets are placed on whether the employee will make it out of the hotspot alive or not. At the end of each day, the members are presented with a video report shot by the employee at the scene, enabling them to follow the progress and get an idea of whether they'll lose or win their bets. And then seven days after the employee entered the hotspot, he or she is allowed to leave and make their way back to safety. If they are successful in their endeavor, and trust me, that's not always the case, they're given a $100,000 completion fee. Does this concept sound terrifying? And does it sound like something you would want to try your hand at? If it does, you'll have to find one of our recruiters and persuade him that you're a worthy candidate. Personally, I didn't have to go looking for one. The recruiter approached me. I was in a bar in Manaus in the northern parts of Brazil, after having spent a month assisting the rebels in Suriname in their attempts to overthrow the ruling president. I was well into my third beer when a somber looking Dutch guy sat down on the stool next to me at the bar. I don't suppose you'd be interested in making some serious money, he said in a broken English accent a few moments after the bartender had passed him an ice cold bottle of Heineken. I looked at him for a few moments, my eyebrows raised. He was tall and skinny and had that sun kissed look that northern Europeans often get after a few days in a tropical environment. He was dressed in an expensive looking polo shirt and white shorts that almost reached down to his knees, and he had brown, expensive looking leather sandals on his feet. The first thought that ran through my mind was that he was having me on, either that or he was working for some drug cartel and wanted me to smuggle something that would result in a lengthy prison sentence when things went belly up. And considering that I had no intention of spending any time in a Brazilian prison, I shook my head. No thanks, not interested mate, I said and I went back to sipping on my beer. From the corner of my eye, I could see the guy grab his wallet and remove something from it. He then slid it across the bar in my direction. I looked down at it and saw that it was a business card. The name on it said, Dirk Vanderklerk, and there was a phone number and a post office box address printed below it. I realized that my offer is highly unusual. The guy said after I picked up the card and I looked at it. But nevertheless, it is a genuine offer. He took another swig from the bottle and wiped the beer from his top lip with the back of his hand. Tell you what, give your friend Danny a call. He knows who I am and he knows that I'm a man of my word. Then if you're still interested, give me a call then we can discuss the details. He then took one last sip of his Heineken, stood up and laughed. That was my first encounter with a representative from Fear Inc. 
A month later, I had earned my first $100,000 completion fee in War Ravished Sierra Leone. I had operated in that country before, but never without a weapon, and never on my own. I'm not going to go into any details about what I did there. Suffice to say, it was a hair-raising experience, and that I was very close to losing my life on several occasions. But somehow, I managed to get out of there in one piece, and I have been able to replicate that feat ever since. As the saying goes, practice makes perfect. Looking back on all of it, I'm still amazed that I managed to stay alive for as long as I have, considering that the average life expectancy of a fearing employee is only a year and a half. I lasted for more than 18 years, and unlike most of my colleagues, I was able to hand in my resignation and walk away from it all with a hefty bank balance. Why did I succeed where others failed? I guess it's all due to my background in the armed forces. I was 17 and a half when I joined the British Royal Marines, and I ended up serving in that regiment for five years, including stints in Northern Ireland, and two very cold and miserable months in the Falkland Islands during the war with Argentina. At the end of my fifth year, I tried out for the SBS, the Special Boat Service, an elite regiment similar to the SAS. I was able to pass selection and spent the next seven years there going on quite a few missions to Northern Ireland and a handful of Africa. I can't go into too much detail, as the missions are classified, but rest assured, it gave me the hands-on experience I needed to make it for as long as I did with Fear Inc. After leaving the SBS, I spent three years working as a military consultant, or as it is more commonly referred to, a mercenary. And that's when I ran into Dirk in that bar in Brazil, and started my career as an employee of Fear Inc. The things I have seen could easily fill several dozen books, and who knows, maybe one day I will sit down and write about all the things I experienced during my time in the organization. But for now, I will only describe what happened on two assignments. Two is more than enough to give you an idea of what being an employee of Fear Inc. is all about. And besides, I hate to repeat myself, the first story I'm going to tell is about what took place on North Sentinel Island, and the second is about what happened when I spent a week in Grozny, Chechnya, during the very bloody and very dirty war with Russia. North Sentinel Island The year was 2008, and I was on board a 200-foot luxurious yacht that belonged to the corporation. I had spent nearly 20 hours flying, the first leg from London to Bangkok, and then from Bangkok to the International Airport in Port Blair, on the South Andaman Island in the Bay of Bengal. The last leg of the journey was only an hour and a half, but by that stage, I had enough flying in I couldn't wait to arrive at my destination. Hence, the first thing I did after I was picked up from the airport and had settled into my cabin was to throw myself down on the bed and get some sleep. I certainly needed it, and I knew I wasn't going to get much of it for the next week. When I opened my eyes six hours later, I could feel the yacht rocking gently from side to side, and I knew that we were on our way to our destination, North Sentinel Island. I spent a few minutes looking up at the ceiling before I got up, splashed some water on my face, and picked up the phone next to the bed. I'm up, was all I said and I put the receiver back in the cradle again. A minute later, there is a soft rap on the door and a young Asian female appeared. Please follow me, sir, was all that she said. I did what I was told and was escorted to the lounge on the upper deck, where two men were seated in a very comfortable looking leather couch. Hey, Mike, good to see you again, Dirk said in his broken English and gestured for me to sit down in one of the chairs. I take it you had a pleasant flight. Well, you know what it's like. I said. After an hour, you start to get bored, and after ten, you start to go bonkers. Dirk let out a polite laugh and nodded, and then he took a sip from the glass in his hand. How you feeling? Are you nervous about going ashore? I lifted my hand and I rubbed the tip of my nose with my fingers. The question was rather pointless, given the tremendous and very obvious danger that the mission represented. No one had ever set foot on that island and lived to tell the tale. They had all been killed. 
and the first few hand witness accounts that had come from people on board boats just off the island had described the horrendous screaming coming from the hapless victims. In some cases, this had gone on for several minutes. I'd be lying if I said that I wasn't feeling slightly nervous, I replied. Dirk nodded. It's always good to be apprehensive, and that's what keeps you on your toes and ultimately alive. Without any fear, you get cocky and overconfident. And then... Dirk quickly drew a finger across his throat and grinned. Okay, the setup is the same as always, the guy next to Dirk said in a deep southern accent. He was in his late fifties, muscular, and had the face of a seasoned poker player. You got the head cam, the usual communication gear and food rations that should last you for a week. Get as much footage of the natives as you can, and get as close to them as possible. We'll stay in touch and give you instructions twice a day. Any questions? I shook my head. After nearly 16 years in the game, I knew how it worked and what was expected of me. And seven hours later, I leaned back from my spot on top of the tubular hull of the Zodiac and momentarily disappeared below the surface of the dark, tropical ocean. The island was half a mile away, and if everything went according to plan, I would make landfall in just under 30 minutes. As I got back up to the surface, I gave the guys in the boat the thumbs up and watched as they turned the Zodiac around and disappeared towards the yacht, which was now just a tiny dot in the distance. And then I let myself sink under the surface again and began swimming towards the shore. The island covers an area of roughly 23 square miles, slightly smaller than Manhattan, and it is mostly covered in trees, apart from a narrow section of sand that stretches around the outer perimeter of the island. It's strictly illegal to visit this place, and the Indian authorities have set up a three mile exclusion zone around the island. Not that anyone in their right mind would want to pay the place a visit. The people who live there have no contact with the outside world, and they will kill anyone who set foot on their island without exception. And it was this inhospitable place that would be my home away from home for the next seven days. If luck was on my side, I would live to tell the tale. If not, while well, I wasn't too keen to think about that. I entered the lagoon on the western side 20 minutes later and remained in the water for another 10 minutes, making sure that no one was keeping an eye on the beach. I had already left my Aqualon, weight belt, diving mask and flippers on the sandy surface just beyond the entrance of the lagoon. If I needed to get out of here in a hurry, I could jump in the water, swim out there, hook on the gear and make my escape. Once I was confident that there wasn't anyone around, I quickly went ashore on the rocky section of the beach. Walking on the sand was out of the question, as it would have left footprints and would have been akin to announcing my arrival with a loud flashbang. In my right hand was my diving knife, which I was clutching tightly and was more than ready to use if someone were to come rushing at me from among the trees. Thankfully, no one did and I slipped into the forest and began making my way towards the center of the island. I was nervous, and the adrenaline was flowing freely through my system, as it always did when I was out on highly dangerous assignments. I was under no illusions as to what would happen if I got caught. I have seen numerous people executed and tortured to death up close. Once during a mission in the Congo, I was less than 40 yards away when Rempels rammed a sharp stake up the arse of a government soldier and drove it through his throat. And then they stuck the thing in the dirt and left the poor sod there for everyone to see. But on that first night, I didn't see any of the natives, which was a good thing, because I had a lot of things to do, such as finding a good hiding spot and setting up camp. Luckily, the vegetation on the island is very dense. There are bushes and shrubbery pretty much everywhere you look, and they make for the perfect cover. The place I eventually chose was located on a ridge covered in thick bushes, which in addition to offering me ample cover, also provided me with a good vantage point. From my new position, I had a 360 degree view of my surroundings, and I would notice straight away if someone tried to sneak up on me. After I had everything set up, I radioed back to the yacht, letting them know that I was in position and safe. 
and then I simply closed my eyes and I slept until the sun rose in the east the following morning. The first sighting occurred towards the afternoon the following day. I had been making my way very slowly towards the east side of the island, and I had been at it for a good four hours, when I all of a sudden heard faint voices up ahead. I immediately stopped and I took cover behind a tree, and sat completely still, my heart pumping furiously in my chest. I knew that I was as close to invisible as it is possible to get. I was dressed in a dark green camouflage suit, had a matching colored bush hat on my head, and my face was completely covered in dark paint. I had everything I needed to blend into the natural landscape, but still, the fear that I was experiencing was raw and very real. No matter how many times you've been in similar situations, you simply cannot control your emotions when death is lurking just around the corner. I probably spent a good 10 minutes behind that tree, focusing on the voices. They weren't getting any louder or fading away, and I correctly assumed that it had come from some type of settlement. As I was preparing myself mentally to push on, I automatically reached for the sheath I had strapped to my leg and very slowly pulled out my diving knife. And then I took a few deep breaths and slid out from behind the tree and began moving towards the voices. There were about a dozen of them sitting on big logs that had been arranged in a horseshoe-like shape. A little further away, two females were sitting in front of a lean-to preparing food. I could see a few huts made from sticks and what looked like palm prods. The huts were sturdy looking things and shaped like pyramids, and I estimated that they could easily house up to half a dozen people at a time. Apart from the two women preparing the food, who were wearing some sort of straw necklaces, they were all completely naked. Their skin was as black as the night itself, and I realized that it would be very tricky to spot them during the evening without the aid of the night vision goggles. I would have to be very careful from here on. From my position behind some bushes about 50 yards away, I could see spears, bows and arrows, and what looked like scythes leaning up against the huts. And for a brief second, I found myself thinking that these were the weapons that they would use against me if they ever discovered me. The thought sent a shiver down my spine, and I quickly rushed it aside. There was no need to focus on things that hadn't happened yet, and for the time being, I was safe. They seemed completely unaware that I was spying on them. Very slowly and with a shaking hand, I pressed the record button on the head cam and began recording the scene before me. Later that evening, after I had returned to my shelter, I remember thinking to myself that this mission would be a fairly easy one. All I had to do was sneak up on the tribe once or twice a day for the remainder of my stay, make a few recordings, and then leave the same way that I had arrived at the end of the seventh day period. And the remainder of my stay was everything but easy peasy, and on quite a few occasions, I was very close to getting spotted. The following morning was when everything started to go downhill. I was still inside my shelter when I heard a faint voice coming from my earpiece that was attached to the front of my suit. I grabbed it and I quickly stuck it in my ear. Receiving instructions about what to do was fairly common, so I wasn't overly surprised to hear Dirk's voice. Hey Mike, how you holding up? No one's tried to kill you yet. No, I'm still here. I whispered into the microphone on my lapel. That's good, Mike. Now listen, we've got some instructions for you. We want you to make your way over to the southern tip of the island where there's a big lagoon. When you get there, we want you to keep an eye on it. I frowned and thought that it was an odd request. Normally, whenever Dirk would give me instructions, it was to get closer to the locals, carry out some risky stunt or remove some type of artifact or another. Why do you want me to go there? I asked, unable to hide the puzzlement in my voice. But Dirk didn't answer, and instead he proceeded to ask me another question. How soon do you think you can get there? I thought about it for a while. I was at least four miles away and I would have to walk through the forest. Six, maybe seven hours. Could be sooner if I don't run into any problems. Okay, good. Start moving and let us know when you arrive. And then he abruptly finished the conversation, 
and I was left to wonder what the hell was going on. I didn't see any of the natives on my way over to the lagoon, nor did I see any signs that would lead me to believe that anyone had passed through the area recently. I stayed close to the edge of the forest, but far enough inside it not to be spotted from the beach, should any of the locals happen to wander by. When you're moving around in hostile territory, you have to be extremely careful, and you just can't rush ahead like you would do if you were going on a hike in your forest at home. You move in increments of around 20 to 30 yards, and then stop and hunker down until you've established that the coast is clear before you start moving again. You also have to make sure that you don't leave any spores behind, such as broken twigs, footprints, or any other signs that would give the people who might want to do you harm any reason to suspect that you're there. It's a cumbersome way of making your way from point A to point B, but it does increase your odds of making it out alive. This is why it took me nearly 5 hours to cover a relatively short distance, but given that I managed to avoid being detected, I reckon that it was worth it. The first thing I did when I reached my destination was to find a suitable hiding spot, and once again, I found a bush that I could crawl into. I was roughly 40 yards above sea level, about 20 yards from the edge of the forest, and had an almost uninterrupted view of the lagoon. I was thirsty, and I awarded myself with a few hundred milliliters of the water in my field canteen before I radioed Dirt to let him know that I was in position. And then I waited, while wondering what was going to happen next. I found out an hour and a half later, when I saw something reflecting the sunlight in the distance. I got my binoculars out of my backpack and aimed it towards the flashing dot in the distance, and saw that it was the Zodiac that had brought me to the island the day before. And as far as I could tell, it was heading straight for the lagoon. I immediately radioed Dirk to find out what the hell was going on. Dirk, can you read me? This is Mike. But there was no reply. Only the familiar background static. Dirk, can you read me? Over. But still, there was nothing. I muttered a silent curse under my breath, and I raised the binoculars again. The boat was getting closer fast, and it was less than one nautical mile away. What the hell are they up to? I thought as the boat gradually grew in size. When they were about half a mile away, I could see that there were three people in the boat, two males and a female. I frowned and I put the binoculars down for a few moments. This was getting stranger and stranger. I lifted up the binoculars again and watched as the Zodiac entered the lagoon and came right up to the beach. And then I looked on in absolute horror as I saw the two passengers, a young woman and a man, by all appearances either Americans or Europeans jump into the water, grab their backpacks, and start walking ashore. A few moments later, the Zodiac turned around and started steaming back towards the entrance of the lagoon at full throttle. I dropped the binoculars and stared open-mouthed at the young duo as they walked further up on the beach, dropped their backpacks in the sand, and sat down. Their backs were turned to me, and they were watching the rubber boat as it disappeared in the distance. I felt a sour taste rise up from deep inside my gut, and I noticed that my hand had started to shake. What the hell were they doing here on this island? They obviously had no idea of what type of place this was, that the locals would kill them in the most horrendous manner imaginable if they ever saw them, which meant that the organization had most likely tricked them into this. I felt an ice-cold sensation form inside my stomach and it quickly spread out towards the rest of my body. I was looking at a pair of human, sacrificial lambs. They had been chosen to die in order to spice things up for the members of Fear Inc. I felt my blood start to boil and I pressed the transmit button on the microphone on my lapel, and then I started whispering furiously into the mouthpiece. Dirk, what kind of sick games are you guys playing here? Those two poor kids will be dead before the top of the hour if you don't turn that Zodiac around and pick them up. I let go of the button, and I listened to the static in my ear. For fuck's sake, answer me, Dirk. Another few moments passed, and I was about to press it again when I heard Dirk's voice in my ear, calm and collected. 
Listen, Mike. I know I didn't tell you about this, but rest assured, it wasn't my decision. I'm just an employee, like yourself. They're going to get killed, Dirk. When the locals see them, they'll chop them into pieces. Jesus Christ, they're only kids. You can't allow that to happen. There was some more static on the line, and for a moment or two, I thought that Dirk had gone away. But then he started talking again. Would it make you feel any better, Mike, if I told you about why they're here, and give you a lowdown on the crimes that they've committed? What do you mean, crimes they've committed? I could hear him sign the other end and then clear his throat. They're meth heads, Mike. Two weeks ago in Bangkok, in a drug-induced psychosis, they cut up the stomach of their three-year-old daughter. After they had finished doing that, they cut her head off and placed it on the windowsill in their living room. Trust me, Mike, these are some truly horrendous people, and they deserve everything that's coming to them. I didn't answer, and Dirk continued, his voice all of a sudden more matter-of-factly. Your job is to keep an eye on them 24-7 from now on. You're not allowed to contact them, or try to warn them about the natives. And if they are discovered, you are to record the entire thing. I don't believe I have to remind you of your obligations to the organization, Mike. That's it. Good luck. And over and out. And thus, my real mission on North Sentinel Island began. I was the director and sole member of the team that had been tasked with documenting a real-life snuff movie involving two kids at barely out of high school. I closed my eyes and took half a dozen deep breaths before I picked up the binoculars again and started on my new assignment. Nothing happened on that first day other than me getting bored out of my brains having to spend 30 hours straight keeping an eye on a young couple hanging out on a beach. But I was a professional, and I had spent more time than that doing surveillance work, so I managed to stick it out. It also gave me ample opportunity to think about what Dirk had told me, about the crime that the couple were supposed to have carried out. If it was true, and I didn't really have any reason to doubt that it wasn't, I didn't really care what happened to the two of them. I can tolerate a lot of things as far as violence and crimes are concerned, but I absolutely cannot stand people who harm young children, period. In that regard, my mission became slightly easier to accept, and things certainly started to become more interesting the following day. I have since asked Dirk if a couple had been given any instructions before they were set ashore, but he has always denied this. He simply said that the couple took it upon themselves. What they did was to make their way into the forest, towards the center of the island, toward the area where the natives were hanging out. And, as I had been instructed to do, I followed behind them, observing their every move. It was quite easy to do, given how loud they were. You ever seen Hollywood movies depicting young American backpackers in Southeast Asia? They're always loud and rowdy, and they stand out like a cat in a swimming pool. And this young couple played the role very well. Both of them were what I would describe as laid-back, pot-smoking hippie types. The guy, who the woman only referred to as Chase, had long blonde hair tied back into a ponytail, and wore a dirty old sweatband around his head. Every second word coming out of his mouth seemed to be, take it easy, cool, and awesome. And after having to spend 12 hours listening to it the first day, I guess you could say that it was starting to rub me the wrong way. The young woman was slightly less annoying, and I'm not quite sure if that was because she talked a whole lot less than Chase. I guess I'll never really know the answer to that question. She had the same long hair as her partner, and she was quite attractive. I've often wondered since how long they would have survived if they would have just stayed on that beach going off for the occasional swim and just dozing off under their makeshift shelter, which was a piece of tarpaulin stretched out in a 45 degree angle from a rope strung between two poles. If luck had been on their side, maybe they would have lasted a few extra days, maybe even a week. It's impossible to tell. And given that they didn't, it's an exercise in futility to go on about it. The truth of the matter is that they'd only been walking inland for less than an hour before things started to go downhill. It started with these strange noises. To me, it sounded like someone was regurgitating their own vocal cords. 
My heart skipped a beat, and straight away, I felt the adrenaline rush into my bloodstream. These were not noises made by any of the animals. They were human-made sounds, something that was confirmed a few moments later, when the birds in the trees above us all of a sudden took off. I froze and stood absolutely still, fearing that we were very close to the natives. The young duo, however, seemed oblivious to it all, and they just kept on walking, talking just as loudly as they had before. Oh my god, I thought. They were going to walk straight into them. And then I immediately realized that the same thing applied to me. I had no idea where the natives were. I suspected that they were somewhere ahead of us, but trying to pinpoint the exact location of a sound in the jungle is extremely difficult, and for all I knew, they could be behind us. It was also a real possibility that they already had a visual on us, and that they were getting ready to strike. Shit, why did I get tricked into spying on these kids? I should have insisted on sticking to the original mission and moved around at my own pace. This was crazy, and it could very well get me killed. I quickly scanned my surroundings, but was unable to see anyone apart from the young couple, who were walking ahead of me without the slightest idea of the precarious situation that they were in. My heart was hammering away now, and I was wound taut as a piano wire. And for the first time since I had set foot on the island, I started to feel scared. The strange sounds continued, and I could tell that whoever caused them were approaching. I kneeled down and I rested on my haunches. And then I reached down and I grabbed the knife from the sheath attached to my leg. I clutched it tightly and held it in front of my chest, the hand holding it shaking badly. And then and there it dawned on me that I might have to use it before too long. There is a big tree about 20 yards up ahead, and I decided to make a dash for it. I took a deep breath, stepped away from the bush I was hiding behind, and I made my way towards it. The strange sounds were very close now, and I was finally able to pinpoint where they were coming from. They were coming from directly ahead of us, from the top of the slight hill. I made it safely over to the tree, and carefully stuck my head out to have a look, and that's when it started. There was a whooshing sound, and then the familiar thump that an arrow makes whenever it embeds itself into a tree trunk. I couldn't see where it hit. But I could see Chase turn towards the right and stare at something, so I suspected that the arrow had hit the tree next to him. I was about 40 yards behind the young couple, slightly to the left and at a slightly lower elevation. It took a second or two before they reacted to the arrow, but when they did, it was with a loud, holy fuck. A few more seconds passed and I could hear the whooshing sounds of a few more arrows, but still, they were not hitting their targets. But this time, the arrows did jolt the young couple out of their paralysis, and they did what most normal people would have done in their situation. They threw themselves around and bolted back in the direction that they had come from. A few moments later, I got my second glimpse of the natives since arriving on the island, and this time, they were a lot more agitated. There were four of them, probably hunters out looking for food, who had accidentally come across the young couple. I stayed where I was, not moving a single muscle. The key to avoid getting spotted in any environment apart from using the right camouflage is to not make any sudden movements. But instead, I followed them with the tiny camera attached to my hat. I turned my head very slowly, doing my utmost to do it as smoothly as possible. This was what the members of Fear Inc. wanted to see, and this is what they paid their premium memberships for. This and the scenes that would play out when the hunters finally caught up with the young couple and killed them. What a freaking sick and messed up world this was, I thought to myself. I waited until the natives had passed me, and when relieved to discover that they hadn't noticed me, then I counted to three and pushed myself away from the tree. And this time, I was running too. Not that there was any real danger of losing track of them, the young woman was screaming hysterically, and the natives were making their loud regurgitating sounds. At the same time, they were sending off more arrows, and I could see one of them throwing a spear. I stepped out of the vegetation and found a natural path that I could follow, about 40 yards or thereabouts behind the natives, and slightly to the right. We were making our way back towards the beach. 
Millions of thoughts were racing through my head at that very moment, but the one that kept repeating itself was whether the young couple was going to make it out of the forest or not. I also wondered if they realized the futility of their actions, that it didn't matter how long they ran for, that in the end, the natives would catch up with them, and this whole thing would come to an abrupt end. Their fates had been sealed the moment they jumped off of that zodiac. I kept on running for another minute, and then I stopped and I took cover behind a tree. I could see the woman lying on the ground, her hands pressed against her thigh. There was an arrow there, and blood was seeping out through the wound. I didn't see when it had struck her, but I did see the moment when the natives caught up with her. She was screaming frantically, and when they stopped in front of her, her arms shot out to protect herself. In addition to this, she was kicking with her good leg, as if she believed that this would somehow keep them at bay. But she was no match for the guy with the spear, who ran forward, holding it high above his head with both hands, and then thrusting it in a quick, downward motion. The weapon hit her lower abdomen, and I was able to see the wooden weapon bury itself into her body. Her face contorted in pain, and the screams intensified. I was only 30 yards away, and I could see everything that was going on. And then the others joined in. They were shooting arrows at her, and hitting her with what looked like maddox and size. And the only words that can truly describe what I was witnessing were barbaric savagery. They were attacking her like she was a worthless rodent. The regurgitating sounds were interspersed with the thick slashing sounds of the sharp implements piercing her skin, and the hard wooden clubs hitting her bones, shattering them. I felt physically ill, and I twitched uncontrollably. This was on par with the incident I had witnessed in the Congo some years earlier. The woman by this stage had realized that facing them with her arms stretched out was not a good strategy, and against all odds, she had managed to turn over onto her side, and was now attempting to drag herself away. But it was no use. The injuries that she had sustained had tapped her of all her strength, and it was only a matter of time before it would all be over. And as it turned out, I didn't have to wait for that long. A few moments later, it came to a quick end when the native with the spear rammed it through the back of her neck and plunged the sharp tip through her throat. At that point, everything stopped. Her attempts at getting away, the hysterical screams, and I guess, her will to live. It had taken less than four minutes from the time the natives had first discovered the young couple until the time the woman was lying mostly on the ground, blood covering most of her body. I looked around, but her boyfriend was nowhere to be seen. He was probably still running towards the beach, trying to save his own hide. I remember having ambivalent feelings about his actions. On one hand, he was a coward for leaving his girlfriend behind, but on the other hand, he was doing what most people do when they're in full-blown panic mode, trying to get away from the imminent threat. I also reminded myself of what they had done to their little girl. Her treatment had been just as bad as the one that I had just witnessed. I held on to that thought in order to better deal mentally with what I had just seen. They did not pursue her boyfriend, at least not straight away. There were other things to take care of, such as tying vines around the young woman's head and hoisting her up from the forest floor. They used a thick branch to achieve this, and when her legs were about two feet off the ground, they tied vines around her ankles and secured those to trees nearby, ensuring that her body remained still. And that's when they literally started to gut her. One of the hunters stepped forward and removed a sharp metal-like object from a rope slung over his shoulder. He then proceeded to push the object against the woman's lower abdomen, really ramming it in there. With a quick upper movement, the metal object sliced its way up to the solar plexus region, and all of the innards came pouring out like a bucket full of gore. I forced myself to look at it, careful not to move the camera away from the action. The organization would no doubt zoom in on the gruesome scene, quite possibly even slow it down so that the members wouldn't miss a thing. They spent an hour mutilating the body before they finally moved on, walking in the direction of the beach and the boyfriend that had managed to escape. And I followed after them, very mindful of what would happen if they ever caught a glimpse of me. For the next seven hours, 
I was telling the hunters around the southern tip of the island. They split up into two groups, which made my job considerably more complicated. Two of them were patrolling the tree line closest to the beach, while the other two focused on the area further inland. They spent half an hour or thereabouts studying the campsite when they eventually found it, going through the contents of the backpacks, but as far as I could tell, they didn't take anything with them. Maybe they intended to return the following day and grab it then. Apparently catching the guy was most important for the time being. Besides, who was going to take off with their newly acquired stuff anyway? They then resumed their search. I don't know if they were able to follow the guy's spore, but if they were, they certainly didn't do a very good job at it, because they weren't able to locate him that day. A few hours before sundown, they left the area and I was able to take a quick break to get something to eat and notify Dirk of what had happened. And then I spent the remaining hours of daylight trying to pick up the trail of the guy, which I found just before the sun had dipped below the horizon. I couldn't actually see him, but I could see the faint footprints leading to his hiding spot. He had done the right thing and tried to cover his tracks as best as he could by smoothing the sand behind him. But seeing the arrow sink into the tree next to him when he had first crossed path with the natives, and knowing that his girlfriend had been captured, not to mention having to listen to the horrific cries as he ran away, it must have shaken him to the bone. And thus, he had been sloppy when he made his way across the beach, and he hadn't taken enough time to do a thorough job. But I knew that he was there, and I intended to get a visual on him later that evening while wearing my night vision goggles. The place that he had chosen was behind a cluster of boulders right next to the ocean, where he wasn't visible from the forest. If you only had to hide for a few hours, this spot would have been perfect, but if you had to spend a prolonged period here, it wouldn't do you any good. There was no natural cover, and after a few hours in the hot daytime sun without any water, your brain would start to fry. A good strategy would have been to move to another location after the sun went down, then head back to the campsite, get some water and provisions, and find a new location to lay low. But this guy was not an experienced soldier, and he had just witnessed a very traumatic episode, so he remained where he was. I did get a visual on him a few hours after sundown, and he was literally hanging onto the boulder for dear life, his face pressed into the rock as if it would somehow make it harder for the natives to spot him. That night, as I settled into my new hiding spot, overlooking the cluster of boulders, I knew that he wouldn't see another sunset. The natives would resume their search the following morning, and they would give him the same treatment that his girlfriend had received, a brutal and painful death. One part of me felt a tiny bit of sympathy for him, but the other and much more dominant part of my brain felt that he was getting his just dessert. In my opinion, child killers deserve no mercy. I was right about the natives resuming their search the following day. I saw them approach the section of boulders just after 9.30 in the morning, and this time, there was a whole lot more of them. I counted seven men on the beach, and I guessed that there were probably more of them scouring the forest. The sight made me slightly apprehensive. At that point, I had no idea how good they were at reading spores and how thorough they would be. If they decided to do a proper search of the entire island, I could find myself in a whole lot of trouble, and I could quite possibly be their third victim. I tried to brush aside the thoughts and worry about that later on should my fears turn into reality. For now, the only thing I had to focus on was the child killer hiding behind the boulder and his rendezvous with death. The natives grew in size in my binoculars and they were now less than 100 yards away. Very carefully, I pushed the record button on the camera and put the binoculars aside, and I prepared myself for what was about to happen next. They discovered him less than half a minute later, when one of the hunters went behind the big stone. I couldn't see what happened at that exact moment, but I could see the guy for a few seconds later when he jumped into the water, and I could see the spear that came flying after him moments later. The water immediately turned red, and the hunter that had thrown the spear jumped out after him. A struggle ensued, and some of the other hunters joined the fray. One of them pushed the guy's head underwater and held it there until he stopped moving. 
I guess the whole thing took less than a minute. And then they dragged the guy ashore and started stabbing him with their scythe-like weapons up on the beach. The bright stand turned red, and the body jerked and twisted every time that it was hit. They were going at it with an aggressiveness that I found hard to fathom. They really hated the guy, and they really wanted to kill him. And the only crime that he was guilty of in their eyes was coming ashore of their island. They continued for another couple of minutes, and by that stage, the guy was truly dead. His body looked like a big piece of flesh that had been dipped in a tub of red dye. Parts of his skin had been peeled away from his muscles, and I could see right down to the bone. When they were done, another very unnerving thing happened. One of the hunters all of a sudden ran towards my hiding spot. I felt my blood go cold, and I had to will myself to lay still. There was no way that he could have seen me. And then when he was about 20 yards away from me, he came to an abrupt stop and he raised his hand in the air. His upper body was covered in the victim's blood, and he had a feral look on his face, as if he had ingested some very potent drugs. The bow in his hand was looking extremely menacing, and I hoped that he wasn't about to fire one of those arrows in my direction. Luckily he didn't, but he started shouting and screaming and hopping up and down. I've often thought later on that he must have suspected that there were other unwanted people on the island, and that it was his way of letting them know that they were next. This routine went on for another few minutes, before he turned around and he walked back to the others. The episode had really shaken me up and I closed my eyes and I focused on my breathing. When I opened them again, I could see the natives were in the process of dragging the guy by his legs further up on the beach. Unfortunately, his head was turned in my direction and I was able to see his face. His mouth was wide open, as were his eyes, and he reminded me of a dead fish, staring stupidly into the distance. It was a horrendous way to die even though he himself had committed a horrendous crime. Maybe God, that is if he actually exists, would have mercy on his soul and take him into his fold. But even if that didn't happen and he was taken straight down to hell, it couldn't be much worse than what he had gone through for the last minute of his life. I spent another five days on that island after that, and as I had expected the natives did a thorough search of the place, for the next three days, they went over the southern and western part of the island, and a few times, I was very close to getting discovered. One of the natives passed less than three feet away from the ditch where I was lying under a thick cover of leaves and branches. I could see the scars on his legs and the thick soles on his feet. I could also see the bottom part of his spear that he used as a walking stick. But thankfully, he didn't notice me, and seven days after I first set foot on the island, I left the place. I swam out of the lagoon, attached my aqualong flippers and weight belt, and continued another mile out from the shore. There, I signaled my flashlight and guided the zodiac to my position. I had survived my mission yet again, and I earned my completion fee. Now, all I wanted to do was relax for a few weeks, recharge my batteries, and try to get the terrible things I had seen on that island out of my system. I couldn't wait to return to civilization, and live like a normal person for a while.